Thanks everyone for the support on my last Spinosaurus video. It's officially my highest viewed video ever. Despite my work summarizing the research leading up to the new tail fossils, there's still a ton of meat on the Spinosaurus bone left to discuss. Since the new paper on the Spinosaurus neotype published back in April, much discourse has been flung this way and that. Through a Twitter storm regarding the new discovery, many points of contention and disagreement were thrown toward the conclusions made in the paper on the new material. As discussed at length in my previous Spinosaurus video, the specimen which had been dug up in Morocco and described in 2014 by Dr. Nizar Ibrahim and his team was not fully excavated. Ibrahim and company went back to the site over the last couple of years and found the same individual's tail. These new fossils help to further demystify the skeletal anatomy of this particular Spinosaur. According to Dr. Ibrahim's interpretation of the fossil material, not only did Spinosaurus have a dented sail, but short back legs and a paddle-shaped tail. Body Posture In order to get a handle on the true posture Spinosaurus took in life, data on its estimated mass and center of gravity must be calculated. The center of gravity is important to understand how an animal rested, moved, and how its weight was balanced when it was alive. Center of mass is a physics phenomenon. It's the single point of an object from which it can be suspended at rest, and gravity won't make it move or rotate regardless of the object's orientation. If you were to suspend this object from any point and allow it to come to rest, the center of gravity will probably lie somewhere on a hypothetical vertical line passing through the point at which you suspended it. Those little dove toys you suspend on the end of your finger by the beak is specifically designed to illustrate this phenomenon. You can do the same thing with any object to find an estimated center of gravity where it's balanced and won't tip over or move. For humans, our center of mass is different between males and females. The center of mass for males is located slightly above the navel, while female center of mass is located slightly below it. If this point can be effectively figured for Spinosaurus, how its body balanced can be estimated, and with this, it can be inferred whether or not Spinosaurus walked on all fours, on its back legs, or was restricted to the water, or maybe something completely novel. The 2014 study, which completely reinterpreted Spinosaurus with the majority of the new fossil material, found the center of gravity closer to the front of the animal. A follow-up 2018 study by curator of dinosaurs at the Royal Terrell Museum, Dr. Donald Henderson, calculated Spinosaurus' center of gravity right in front of the pelvis. To find the center of gravity with the 2020 tail material included, Ibrahim and team used a digital model with various takes on tissue density. With an estimated length of 11 meters, or 36 feet, and a mass of 3,219 to 4,173 kilograms, or 3.5 to 4.5 tons, the center of mass was calculated just over one femur length from the pelvic limb joint. This center of gravity estimate is in between the 2014 and 2018 estimates. This should mean Spinosaurus is definitively, as of now, not a quadruped. The 2020 study reports a facultative quadrupedal gait. This means the animal was not forced to be a quadruped, but may have been able to use its forelimbs while on land if it needed to. Yes. The knuckle-walking, quadrupedal model is incorrect. It was more than likely a biped most of the time. What neutral poses it took when standing or moving is completely up for debate though. The 2020 paper admits they undermuscled the tail. Their volume of the restored tail is considered conservative by the authors. Increasing musculature in the tail and thus its volume would make the tail heavier and pull the center of gravity further backwards which may invalidate Ibrahim's claims of any form of quadrupedality entirely. The center of gravity in reconstructions released with the 2020 study looks a little off. This may be due in small part to the neck meets. The Spinosaurus's neck definitely looks a little too thick. This level of neck thickness makes it too front heavy. In attempting to reconstruct it, it may have had a thinner neck. Take a look at the cervical, or neck ribs. These ribs are rather long, which should mean there were more muscles near the base of the neck and at its connection with the shoulders and chest. This would help lighten the front end and stop the animal from tipping over. Tipping over was one of the reasons the 2014 study considered it somewhat of a quadruped. It's possible Spinosaurus could completely avoid walking on all fours if they employed a more vertical stance than typical theropods as outlined by paleontologist Dr. Andrea Kaw. 
To understand how the critter could take a more vertical stance, models of the vertebrae were made with input from the more complete neck of the related sigil massosaurus. Since the neck vertebrae is essentially all of the known material of sigil massosaurus, the validity of this animal has been questioned over the years since its discovery. This interpretation agrees with that used by the late Dr. Dale Russell when he described the neck of Spinosaurus back in 1996. Dr. Ka, therefore, reconstructed the neck of the new Spinosaurus in a subvertical position. The neck vertebrae have reduced neural spines and neutrally lie in a limp S shape. With this subvertical neck position, Dr. Call reconstructs the posture of Spinosaurus to be more vertical overall, with the animal holding its neck up and head pointed slightly down, with its chest and arms completely free of the ground. Puny Drumstick Boy Many criticize the comparatively puny hind limbs of the 2014 and 2020 interpretations of the neotype. Plenty of you YouTube commenters have retorted they look much too small and weak to hold up the animal's weight. The legs of the 2014 and 2020 interpretations would have to be held nearly straight in order to clear the arms of the ground. Could this straight position be the only way to hold up its weight? The mass of Spinosaurus is estimated at 3 to 4 tons. This is rather light compared to other giant theropods which meet or surpass similar 10 meter lengths. Dr. Mark Witten took it upon himself to do some calculations on the weight-bearing capabilities of the limb bones in different postures, based on measurements from the 2014 study. He found they were specifically adapted to hold a lot of weight when in a straight columnar position, but would fail in any other pose. Using a model and calculations, leg strength would fail if loaded with one slightly less than 4-ton weight in a normal theropod position. A 4-ton weight was used because the animal's weight is estimated to be around 4 tons. When placed in the vertical position, the leg withstands many 4-ton masses. These shouldn't be taken at face value, as Dr. Witten even admitted they neglect some nuance associated with theropod femoral posture. However, if these calculations are anywhere in the ballpark of Spinosaurus's true weight-bearing strength, it proves it could walk around bipedally on land without the help of its forelimbs altogether. Those saying they were too small to contain enough muscles to support the weight, you're simply incorrect. Even though the entire hind limb is small, the places on the bones where muscles attach were not. The fourth trochanter is the knob of bone which emerges from the backside of the femur near the top of the middle part. It is a main attachment site of the caudofemoralis muscle, which is a very important muscle for locomotion in archosaurs. The fourth trochanter of the 2014 neotype Spinosaurus femur is proportionate to the rest of the body when compared to other large-bodied theropods. This means the caudofemoralis muscle was also not shrinky-dinked and was similar in size to those of other large-bodied, muscle-bound theropods, giving the legs of Spinosaurus suitable force for powerful propulsion on both land and in water. The tail of a sail. Reconstructing the correct shape to the sail is more difficult than you'd think because the spines themselves are poorly preserved on all specimens. All of the 1915 specimens found by Stromer were broken at their ends. Moreover, the neural spines were found unattached to the round centrum parts of the vertebrae. Many of the vertebrae were broken or deformed at the tips as well. The exact arrangement of those vertebrae found by Ernst Stromer was unclear and remains unclear to this day, since all were not found miraculously lined up as they were when they were inside the animal's body. As the exact arrangement of the spines and vertebrae is currently uncertain, many hypotheses have been proposed on how they were truly arranged. There is a little bit of certainty as to how the front vertebrae were arranged, but far less confidence lies in the arrangement of the back ones. When the vertebrae were cleaned and put on display back in 1915, they were arranged in a tight arc. Ernst Stromer eventually adjusted this composition in 1936 by restructuring the spine into a long, gentle slope. The vertebrae from the backmost section of the spine are slightly reclined backwards. This is also present in the frontmost spines, but in the opposite direction. As Dr. Witten notes, there is a common misconception when reconstructing the neural spines of Spinosaurus to make them straight. Based on the available spines, the front and back ones should bend forward and back respectively. 
Ernst Stromer reconstructed the ends of the broken sail spines and added more where they were missing. This resulted in the long, square, gentle sloped spine as I mentioned before. There is currently no single completely correct reconstruction. When it comes to paleo art and reconstructing extinct critters in the least wrong, most aesthetically pleasing way, many of these hypotheses could be correct. That being said, the new tail specimen makes it rather clear the spine dipped sharply into the base of the tail. The dip in the center of the sail, inferred by Dr. Ibrahim, is a bit more on the speculative side. Though National Geographic parroted this interpretation throughout all their coverage of these discoveries, Dr. Mark Witten suggests the older reconstruction by Stromer, which outfitted the animal with a non-dipping sail, has just a little bit more merit. The vertebra which causes the center sail dip in the Ibrahim interpretation should be placed further up the spine like in Stromer's skeletal diagram. Though the neotype specimen shares a lot of similarities with past Spinosaurus specimens, there are some anomalies which don't 100% match up with the holotype. The neotype's neural spines are generally shorter and slenderer than those seen in the holotype. Does this mean the neotype had a shorter, slenderer sail than the holotype? Could this be due to sexual dimorphism, species variation, individual variation, or change with growth? It's unknown for sure. A solid answer for this is slippery. The new 2020 study suggests Spinosaurus aegyptiacus is a highly variable species. This would encompass all differences as sexual dimorphism, change with growth, or individual variation. If this holds true, then it is okay to compile all data from the holotype and neotype. In opposition to this amalgamation of Spinosaur parts, a 2016 and 2018 study suggests the fossils of the holotype and neotype represent closely related but separate species or genera. If this separate view holds more water, then the sail shape of the Moroccan neotype is more indicative of the true shape. Thankfully for the paleo artists out there, you may have more than one way to reconstruct the sail for now, and no single one is totally wrong. The Sail of a Tail In the last Spinosaurus video, I neglected to elaborate on the zygopophyses. If you've seen my Diplocolis video, you'll know what a zygopophysis is. For those who haven't, zygopophyses are the knobs on the front and back of a vertebrae, which hooks onto the same knobs of the vertebrae before and after it. The ones at the front end of the vertebrae are more hook-like and are called pre-zygopophyses. The ones at the back are more often the opposite, a scoop or indent which holds the hook from the vertebra before it. They are called post-zygopophyses. Different animal groups have slightly different arrangements, with some animals losing much of these spines. In the case of the new Spinosaurus tail material, the zygopophyses are reduced at the thin part of the tail. They're shrunken. This means the side-to-side -side movement of the tail vertebrae was very flexible and loose. Spinosaurus could flex the thin part of its tail far more than other theropods. This should make it a good tool for use in swimming, as stated by Dr. Nizar Ibrahim and his team. The contention on the true flexibility, and thus exactly how Spinosaurus used this tail, begins and ends with how long and overhanging the neural spines are, and how truly flexible the bone would have been in life. Since my last video, Dr. Mark Witten posted a diagram illustrating his opposition. It illustrates how the vertebrae should not be able to move as much as the lack of zygopophyses suggests. The overhanging neural spines should break or unspool the vertebrae if the tail curved even in relatively loose arcs. As you can see, the neural spines would bust through the soft tissue which connected the vertebrae into a paddle. Additionally, this could break the spines off the center of the vertebrae. Overall, a big nasty mess. Dr. Witten and a few others over on Twitter made the comparison between the contradictory overhanging spines and tail flexibility of Spinosaurus and the bizarre leaf-shaped tail of the Drepanosaur, Hypronectar. This probably tree-dwelling reptile from the Triassic period has a rather similar tail. The neural spines also overhang the other neural spines of the vertebrae after it. But in the case of Hypronectar, the long thin spines are on the underside of the tail. They're not neural spines but rather chevrons. A similar conundrum had already been raised for the tail of Hypronectar by Silvio Renesto and colleagues in 2010. 
Unfortunately for this comparison, the vertebrae of Hyperonectar are quite different than Spinosaurus. The zygopophyses of Hyperonectar were strong and clamped each vertebra together tightly. This means its tail was completely rigid along its length, which cannot be said for the tail of Spinosaurus. The other point I regurgitated and agreed with in my last video was the comparison to the tail bones of fish. Most fish have extremely tall, thin spines, structurally supporting the fins. Though the comparative anatomy and functional morphology seems to match, it would be foolish to think the bones of a dinosaur and a fish are similar. First of all, fish bones are way smaller and way thinner than the Spinosaurus, even accounting for size. Secondly, the bone which fish use is more flexible than most tetrapods, which includes the bones of Spinosaurus. I can then rule out this comparison between fish and Spinosaurus. However, this only tells me Spinosaurus bones were not as flexible as fish. It does not tell me how flexible they truly were. Throughout Dr. Witten's Twitter discussion on the flexibility of Spinosaurus tail vertebrae, many other scientists with a bit more expertise in the field of biomechanics chimed in. Despite the overall size of the neural spines of the tail vertebrae, their 15 mm width allowed the living bone to flex more than Witten's diagram suggests. It may seem counterintuitive. Bones are hard, dense, and help structurally support you on the inside. But living bones are not super hard, rock-like secretions of the body. They're often plasticky and capable of flexion. Don't just take my word for it. Next time you get some bone-in chicken, gently bend the bones. They won't break until you brutally snap them at their point of weakness. Muscles and ligaments holding these semi-flexible bones together, and helping to push and pull them, would allow the relatively thick bony rods of the bound Spinosaurus tail vertebrae to bend without failing. Based on the results of the Spinosaurus tail water flume test, and the comparison to the tails of other non-avian theropods, crocodilians, and newts, the tail of Spinosaurus is simply not quite as flexible as it is being portrayed in the PR campaign surrounding the new find. The tail is shown as even more flexible than a crocodile, which we know is untrue. With the data compiled so far, we can be certain of only a few things. This new tail confirms Spinosaurus was tied to the water. The calculations done on the body physics tells us it couldn't have walked on all fours, but was a biped like other theropods. Everything we currently know about Spinosaurus continues to tell us it's more similar to other theropods than it is different. It may be that Spinosaurus was a checkpoint transitional form between the heron-like early Spinosaurs and an even more aquatic Spinosaur form we don't have data of yet. This roughly ends my discussion of these parts of Spinosaurus. The new discovery is quite fantastic on multiple accounts. As more research is done on Spinosaurus and the Spinosauridae, more fascinating insights into its ecology and behavior will become known. Even with the tremendous amount of new data published on Spinosaurus in the last two decades, it remains the ultimate moving target for dinosaur scientists and paleoartists. What more could I go over with regards to Spinosaurus? Plenty. I think there's enough data and opinions on Spinosaurus for me to make a few more videos on the beast. Did it have lips? Was it the only one in a continent-wide distribution? Would a Tyrannosaurus really get its ass handed to it by the sailback? Let me know in the comments below what other Spinosaurus topics you want me to cover. If you like this video, claw the like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. If you want to join the guild, curse out the notification bell, just so you're in the know with everything edge. Thanks for watching.